I'm going to kick it off with a, a few questions for the, the panelists for the group. Uh, Sirnush is taking um, uh, questions Q&A from the crowd with her interface, and she is going to actually relay some of them to me. So it should be the, uh, the relay for you guys. Um, first off, I think a, a general question. Um, it came through some discussion while we're sitting listening to all the talks. Uh, if you'd like to augment yourself, what would you choose? So who wants to start? Make it personal here. Well, obviously, aging without degradation or disease would be one of the first ones on my list. Sure. Um, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> mind having a, a one terabyte uh, flash memory there. <laughs> George, what would you what would you pick? Uh, I put a few. I put a few lists uh, on my list. Uh, you know, being able to be cryo preserved would be uh, nice. I would, wouldn't, wa you wouldn't want to be cryo preserved for the whole trip because uh, the radiation damage will accumulate. You want to be able to go in and out. That, that's a, that's an even higher bar. Uh, but certainly cognitive. There's a number of cognitive goals that one would have. Uh, so you, you would want to the limit with but by cry up earth, so you can go where you want. You want to see the yeah. stars, just yeah. physically be there. Right. Okay. And radiation resistance. Yep. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> That's useful for a lot of things. Ed? Um, I, I think I would go for enlightenment. I feel like, you know, the understanding the human condition and, and understanding the nature of suffering and happiness. So much of religion and society and culture is aimed at those things, and, and, um, and yet we still struggle with it. So, but yeah, can we understand? I'm, I'm with you all properly. the way there. Actually, taking a cue from Max, I mean, I would like to uh, know what this is all about. So if my brain can get to the next topological level where the universe makes some sense, uh, yeah. then maybe I've attained something. And I'd like to play the piano and keyboard a little better. Who knows? Oh, yeah, good. That's you, yeah. yeah. David. Uh, yeah. Is this on? Can you hear me OK? Yeah, it's, it's hard to follow that. Uh, <laughs> find the, the gene for the meaning of life and everything. Um, so David Ewing Duncan's a reporter. He wrote a book recently about this, and what I said to him was, what was that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'll hold it up. All right. Tune into an Australian accent, too. Um, so anyway, the, David Ewing Duncan has a book about this, what would you do if you could have a, a robot, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, I think it'd be good if we didn't have to sleep. I think it'd be great if we could remember everything we heard, saw, and other people heard and saw. It's getting that, that way. We heard uh, about the ability of that about to occur. Uh, I also think that suffering would be nice to avoid for all of us and uh, everyone else on the planet. Is it? I guess that's a laundry list, sorry. That's um, mine. Yeah, so many, so many, Max, go ahead. I just wanted to chime in on the multiple requests for figuring out what it's all about and the meaning of life. I feel that if I've learned anything from my life studying physics so far is that we should really stop looking for our universe to give meaning to us because it's really us who are giving meaning to our universe. Right? We don't find the meaning in Maxwell's equations and, and the Schrodinger equation. In fact, if there were no consciousness in our cosmos, then there would be no, no happiness, no pain, no suffering. And the whole thing would be meaningless, a giant waste of space as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. <laughs> it's, right. it's really ultimately about understanding what is it that makes a quark well, blob have experiences of joy and, and suffering. And, and then asking, yeah, what kind of future do we want to create where there's po as much pos as possible of the good experiences? <laughs> yeah, actually, Max, you reminded me, the reason I brought up David Duncan, uh, this is the reason I need to augment my memory because it's gone in a few seconds. but. Uh, one of the comments in his book is, uh, it wasn't my comment, was that I would love to know everything, a robot to tell me everything. That would be the worst. Right? I, I find life is, has meaning because there's things to discover. You know, most of us are scientists, so this is what we live for. So I think learning the meaning of life, if we knew that, uh, I, I don't think I'd be able to get out of bed in the morning. I seem to remember, Max, that you're an anthropocist. Maybe I'm overextending myself here, but the universe is here in a way so that we can be here, or the you know, multiverse is here, so that uh, the laws of physics are the way they are. There's nothing necessarily to, there's always more to learn, but the big questions are, are just because there's so many possibilities. 
Well, I like to be taking more humble spin on, on this. I don't think that the universe is here for us or owes us anything, and we should be grateful <laughs> that, that for what we have. But, but certainly, we, it would be a mistake to think that we are in a random place in all of reality. Of course we're not. Mm -hmm. Even within our, within our solar system, it would be much more likely to be somewhere in, far out there in between Uranus and Neptune or on Earth, the more typical place would be to be in the middle of the planet. Are we surprised that we're not there? No, of course not. You know, we're in an, our cosmos that we know has a very tiny fraction of it, which is like an oasis, habitable, friendly, supporting of life. And of, co of course, you know, that's where we find ourselves now. Um, but um, we shouldn't feel that our universe owes us something and will always take care of us if we screw up our planet either. Yeah. So yeah. I take this more as a call yeah. to be grateful for what we have, take really good care of it, and yeah. see if we can use our wisdom and technology to, to grow our races and make more of our universe yep. exactly. friendly and habitable and hopefully have positive experiences in it. Um, a question maybe for Ed and, and George and any of the biologists, perhaps hmm. uh, uh, David. Will this Interface that we make into our brain, something we're going to wire our brain. Okay, we just make the brain even more complicated, and we can do some things with the organical, organic stuff that we already have inside <laughs> with, with some genetic modification. But if we do connect to this outside world through uh, interface to something electrical, is it going to be wired or grown, or will it be a hybrid? Because the language of the body is not wires, and you guys work hard to put wires in the brain, and your colleagues do. Not easy to, to do that. Uh, on the other hand, nerves, n neurons just grow, and you know they 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 have you have ways of making them grow in certain ways. Will this develop to the point where we can actually grow our interface and have a place to plug in instead of having to have all these wires all over the place, which is what people think now? Okay. You know, I I think that uh, we are the, the bio wires are are particularly remarkable at their ability to find the right place and make long distance connections. My question is, what are we interfacing to? So that's the kind of presumes there's something outside of our brain that's more amazing than our brain. Mm. Uh, and the main thing that's outside of our brain that's more amazing than our brain is, is all the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually quite important. Um, and, and certainly there are certain things that, uh, that, that silicon does better than we do. Um, and, uh, but that, but one, you know, I think that's why I was talking about a ret, you know, retinas that go both ways. Is you have a, you know, two dimensions is, is fairly convenient for, uh, 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 you know, a uh, high bandwidth yeah. interface. Um, Ed? Yeah, I, I, I think it kind of goes back to this question of what language are we speaking to the brain and how are we interpreting the data we get out of the brain? and. Uh, you know, knowing what the natural representation of things in the brain, uh, you know, uh, what does it really mean is, is still an open question. Um, you know, a lot of us in neuroscience will look at uh, a neuron pulsing and, and say, oh, look, that seems to be representing some visual stimulus out there. But what really matters is what other neurons in the circuit are listening to it, right? If a neuron's very talkative but nobody's listening, it didn't, it didn't do anything. So I think part of the problem is, is understanding a bit more about the processing and, and understanding the principles of it and, and in order to make interfaces that work well. My hope is that if we have a set of building blocks, optical and you know, genetic and, and material and chemical and all that, and we start to understand how to speak that language, we can then you know, think backwards from that and pick you know, probably a hybrid, as we were alluding to earlier, a set of interfaces to make it as meaningful as possible. Yeah, it's, it's amazing already what we can do just talking to the motor cortex or to the uh, you know, uh, uh, audio and, and vision processing. Um, and it tends to be something almost like a Cartesian map there, so it, it, it's not hard. It has to be some adaptation. But to go deeper, you're very right. There's a different language that's spoken in the brain that we, we really have to adapt to. Well, and the brain can adapt to it, plasticizes. Uh, well, the other reason why it's important to achieve that understanding is um, also because there's often a cost. So, you know, um, people have stimulated this part of the brain, the dorsal mm -hmm. lateral prefrontal cortex in humans in many studies. Um, but uh, it might change one thing positively, it might change another thing negatively. So mm -hmm. people have found changes in trust and gullibility and mood and all sorts of stuff from stimulating one region. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, um, you know, even deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, which is a, a fantastic triumph, don't get me wrong, um, you know, helps probably about 100,000 patients so far, but it does uh, make many people more impulsive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding what 
you know, hitting the keyboard does to the circuitry is really important. Yeah, many complicated effects. Um, Patty, um, and the rest of you can, can comment too. Um, how do you, when, when the world understands us better than we know ourselves, which is what, you know, mm -hmm. the fields that we work in kind of aim toward, uh, how do we avoid being manipulated all the time? Because, you know, certainly the delivery can be tailored exactly to us. We see it online, but it's going to get worse once we're, <coughs> we're, you know, exposed to these other interfaces mm -hmm. that we're building. And when we get rid of our smart wearables, how can we avoid being stupid once we rely on that? Right, right. Yeah, that's why I included uh, that slide at the end of my presentation. I think to the extent that we can avoid dependency or build interfaces that maybe you use um, uh, for a while to develop some of the capability internally, for example, um, we have to really think carefully about that dependency issue and, and um, which tasks are okay to delegate to a machine because they're maybe not so critical or which knowledge uh, and which other skills um, we wanna keep in our own wetware so we always have access to it or, and nobody else has access to it um, and can control it. But yeah, we're definitely on the wrong path right now with um, sort of data being owned by companies as opposed to the people who whose data it is. Um, so there's a lot of uh, changes that are needed also in terms of the deployment and commercialization of these types of systems, um, uh, the laws, et cetera, that govern uh, the, who has access to the data, who, who controls it, who can share it, and so on. Yeah. Uh, the incentives in many ways are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, in principle, too, these systems, in addition to being a crutch, could also be a trainer. Where mm -hmm. you know the, you've done work in language learning yourself, where you're always being subjected mm -hmm. to information yeah. at the right time, at the right way, uh, in the right mode. The future of learning could very much be a, mm -hmm. a big part of this. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, uh, if we have to look out, say, 50 years from now, I would say that there are no more schools, or maybe less than 50 years, but you'll have a device that knows exactly what you know because it's always been with you and it knows what you don't know and it knows what you're ready to learn and not ready to learn and the whole thing can be personalized and maybe it knows what, you're, what you want to, sort of uh, what goals you have, et cetera, and it can totally personalize um, learning and it's sort of something that happens all the time uh, in all contexts as opposed to uh, when you're, say, absorbing some specific information from a screen or whatever. Um, it's sort of part of life, basically. Until George yeah. gets the big brain with the cache DNA, uh, <laughs> we have to keep it outside for a while and work on the interface. Yeah, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> I just want to plus one mm -hmm. what you said there, Patty, and I think just as in our brain, <laughs> the individual cells will only thrive if the bigger part, if organism that they're part of, namely you, functions too, so that it gives the cells incentive to cooperate and do the right thing and kills off the cancer cells and, and provides blood vessels for the others. Uh, similarly, we have to think of our world, our society as an organism. We can only thrive as individuals if it works well, right? And um, right now, the whole foundational tenet of, of capitalism and why market economy is supposed mm -hmm. to be good is based on this idea that if the whole system has good institutions that in gives the right incentives, to us individuals, then we will, in, out of our self-interest, do stuff which helps everyone. And you all know there are very many ways in which that can, can fail. And I think uh, all of us who think about building these technologies, it's not enough to just fit work on th these organisms sitting on these chairs here. We also have to think about society itself yeah, and how we can fix, try to understand and fix that at the same time. Yeah. To make sure these things get used for the good things you want and not just mm -hmm. to hack us because we humans are very hackable very much uh, on that note um max with the future of life institute and you know all of your great work there uh a lot of it is is trying to imbue ai at least from what, what i've understood with with core set of ethics or some ethical principles a little bit like the three laws of robotics in some ways. You want to simplify mm -hmm. it and go back to Asimov, right? You've got a fundamental core that somehow or other is ethical. And are you just blindly trusting that as the AI becomes superhuman, that'll be intact? Will it be able to encapsulate it? We, can, we don't know its aims. At a certain point, we will not know what it's doing. Could it rationalize its way out of that? 
Yeah, great question. First, I want to shout out, we're very grateful to you also for being one of the, part of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Future Life yeah. Institute. So there are actually just a lot of people in this area who are. Uh, I think to create a great future with advanced AI, there are three different, in, in, in addition to the philosophical questions of what goals we want mm -hmm. the AI to have, there are three technical nerdy questions that we need your help to solve. One is how can we make machines even understand our goals in the first place? And try to explain to your laptop, you know, your, some of your more, your, your goals and it's gonna have, have completely no clue, right? And second question is how can we make machines actually under, adopt the goals? Those of us who have children know that there's a big difference between our kids understanding what we want them to do and <laughs> actually adopting the goals. And, and the third is even if we can crack those two, how do we make them retain those goals as they get smarter? So, mm -hmm. like, my two sons were very into Legos when they were little. Now, they're 17 and 19, not so much, <laughs> right? If we make machines that are very excited about being nice to humanity, we don't want them to get as bored with that goal as no. my kids got with Legos, mm -hmm. as they get uh, smarter. Mm -hmm. But I think, hard as they are, all three of these are actually technical questions, mm -hmm. which, there has already been, started to be a lot of progress on it. And I would encourage those of you who are actually in computer science and math and, and related fields to consider actually publishing some papers on this because if we can't solve those questions before we need, we have machines powerful enough that they require those solutions, we're totally screwed. And we're lucky here in that we probably have, hopefully have a decade or two or three years more but it might take a few decades to solve these questions. So let's start working on them now so we have the solutions when we need them. Do you see having the human as an integral part of the AI through extended intelligence an important part of keeping them ethical at a certain point? Or is that agnostic to that? I, I would rather, I think that's putting the cart in front of the horse. You know, we don't, the purpose of humans isn't to help the AI be more ethical. The purpose of building yeah. AI in the first place yeah, is to help, is to help us humans sure. <laughs> have, <laughs> have the life that we're dreaming of having, right? That mm -hmm. has to be what comes first. And if we build machines that, uh, if we can't even figure out how to make machines that don't get hacked and don't crash, I mean, raise your hand if your computer has ever crashed, right? <laughs> if we can't even crack that one, <laughs> before we, we unleash, we build AGI and <laughs> super intelligence, who are we kidding, yeah, yeah. you know? And then all this shiny technology we build can either be, can either malfunction and harm us or, or get hacked and, and be turned against us. So these are things we can work on right now and they'll have short-term applications even for cybersecurity and high reliance systems. And then we can build on that sure. as we go forward. Uh, sir, Nush, maybe we can start taking, oh, do you have anything? Well, I was, I'm curious in the surveys that you've done of AI uh, experts, to what extent they believe that um, general intelligence in machines also includes the machine setting its own goals and having drives like curiosity, mm -hmm. self-preservation, et cetera. Um, have you asked these questions? Because I mean, it's fascinating. Some people will say, ah, oh, machines can never have goals. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you ask them, you know, does a cruise missile have a goal? You know, if you're chased by one, frankly, you don't really care about if it's conscious <laughs> and feeling pleasure or, but it has a very goal-directed <laughs> behavior, it seems like, and that's what bothers you. It but acts as if it goals, has a goal. Larger goals like we, curiosity. Sure. Sure. And uh, so, so finding the meaning of life. Sure. Things like that. <laughs> there, I, so, yeah. so point one is we tend to build machines with some sort of purpose in mind. That's why we want mm -hmm. them. But I, I think it's important to remember that the, the mind space of possible minds that can be built tabula rasa <clears throat> is vastly larger than the mind space of evolved organisms, right? Mm -hmm. We all have these Darwinian goals to okay, make copies of our DNA, so make sure to eat breakfast and drink and try to find someone to make, the, make babies with, all that stuff. <laughs> all that's totally optional if you design the mm -hmm. mind. And, and I think rather than ask, again, what will these minds be like, we should ask what do we want them what to be like. be like. It's mm -hmm. not even obvious if you have a home, a help, you have a helper robot that, that, can, that is, can do everything you can, whether you would actually want it to uh, be, um, 
conscious so you can feel it's not just bluffing you when it's talking, or if you want it to be like an unconscious zombie so you don't feel guilty about mm -hmm. switching it off. Mm -hmm. What would you prefer? The zombie. <laughs> 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 of course, consciousness is the, one of the big mysteries, right? Uh, Harari's book talks a lot about superintelligence doesn't need consciousness. Uh, but I, I think it's a little bit of a it could be mysticism there. That, you know, so many people they, they think that intelligence and consciousness are something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms. It has nothing to do with physics or some secret sauce or whatever. It's all physics. I think it's all about information <laughs> processing, and we should be humble and acknowledge that, all right, uh, we currently don't know what kinds of information processing give rise to these subjective experiences of colors and emotions and so on. But we do know, and we have people on the panel who know a lot about the fact that most of the information processing in our brain is, un we're not conscious of it, yeah. some of it is. We should, maybe some of you can figure out what the equations are so we can Marvin be scientific Minsky about this. had one of the best answers for consciousness that I remember. He used to say that uh, he thought it was the diagnostic mechanism in our brain. It was the self-check. Mm. That's why we're conscious. Mm. So there's whole layers of mind. Anyway, uh, let's open it up to uh, questions or news. There must be questions coming from the crowd. Yeah, we'll try to group some of the questions. Uh, so uh, what legal or public policy frameworks would be needed to appropriately and effectively govern a world of Zapians? Augmentation for communization or democratization, how do you envision that world? And probably I direct that to George and Ed and David, mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah. How do we protect people from hacking? How do we, with the augmentation, make people kind of like equal in the society? And what are the immediate steps that we have to do today for that? Well, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll go. Uh, my, my answer is probably a little bit too boring. I think we're already enhanced beings and we, mm. our laws are working reasonably well. That what the, the problem that we have in society now and will just get worse is the disparity between rich, poor um, across the planet. So one of those, uh, that can't be, well, you can change the law, you can change taxes and inheritance, uh, um, estate taxes. But I think that uh, pretty much it's, we're gonna be the same animal, um, we're still gonna, fall in love and we're going to get sad, we're going to feel self-conscious um, no matter you know, how long we're around for. And I think that laws don't matter there. Um, I think that we've been very lucky uh, here in the US and in, in UK and Australia to have, and Canada, to have laws uh, across Europe too, laws that allow humans to thrive. Um, an example of that is this city. It's quite an incredible city to live in actually. So I think that uh, you know I can't see major laws having to be changed other than trying to make sure everyone has access to this. But there might be other ones these guys are going to say about uh, protecting us from rogue robots and humans <laughs> going crazy. Or bad genes. Hmm? Laws to protect you from bad genes. Oh, yeah, it's true. You can get organisms introduced that, that do have level of genes in them. Uh, Kevin Esfeld, of course, worries about that very much. I just had lunch with him yesterday. Uh, you know him very well, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, convinced, uh, David's point, that, uh, that, the, grow that there, the disparities between the rich and poor will necessarily grow. Uh, in, in particular, the, the, the uh, <clears throat> technology can be distributed uh, equitably. Uh, it may be that there's always somebody who's uh, considerably wealthier but to some point, you don't really care. I mean, I mean, I think many of us would not particularly want to trade places with Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, uh, um, but we, we certainly would not want to trade places with somebody who's at the bottom of, of humanity right now. But, but things are getting better in general. The violence is getting less. The, uh, according to Steven Pinker, the... Uh, um, uh, various infectious diseases are becoming extinct, like smallpox, polio, and guinea worm. Uh, and uh, even knowledge is getting more widespread because uh, uh, cell phone technology is spreading in a very cost-effective way. So I, I don't think it's inevitable that, that the meaningful gap continues to grow. I think the meaningful gap between, say, the desperately poor and the middle class is shrinking, could shrink, and the rest of it, who cares? Mm -hmm. 
do you think there would be a need to restrict knowledge? I mean, Kevin is, is obsessed by this with biotech yeah. working in your area. And that the long tail is, is the only issue I really have Pink. Pinker's right. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a great viewpoint. But the long tail is disruptive to that potentially, where very few people, noise in the system essentially, can access enough destructive power to, uh, to, to make a real problem. It's extremely difficult to restrict knowledge. I mean, yes. Kevin and I have published a number of papers together, uh, but I, I think that nuance I'm not uh, comfortable with. Uh, uh, I, I probably would not have published the sequence of smallpox and uh, 1918 flu virus and, and various enhanced viruses since then. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't have happened anyway. Uh, I think what's safe, what the thing that can protect us is um, having a lot more people on the positive side, having very few, few motivations for doing something negative, possibly having better psychiatric care uh, <laughs> as one of the ways that the motivations can get messed up. Uh, and also dispersing ourselves in a way where it's hard for these bad things to get to us. So some of us sh should live in bunkers and some of us should go to other planets and other solar systems. Uh, or that's going to be a, a much well. more potent <laughs> barrier to, yeah. to the self-destruction than uh, hiding information. I, information is going to get found. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the truth about the world will be known. Yeah. Or ideally, we get to our augmented utopia somehow or other early enough that uh, the tail doesn't hit us first. Um, coming back to Ed's uh, talk where you talked about how understanding the brain probably can give us one more step towards uh, understanding the soul, there is a question about that. What would you like to preserve in humans of our understanding of ourselves, race, gender? Do we need to have children? Do do we need to be ourselves or can we just merge our brains or our souls into this like hive mind or hive soul? And um, yeah, with regard to human augmentation, what your take on the idea of like soul, body, slash brain? I'm glad you saved the easy question for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's see. Do we have a, Any, a, anyone a, is we welcome to take <laughs> on everything. I think Patty has a lot to say here as well. But it is, it, there are a couple ways to try to begin to begin to begin to tackle the question, but it's, uh, it would just be the beginning of a beginning. Yeah. I think one question is, um, you know, what do we want? And mm -hmm. one of the, the, the sort of trickiest parts about brain technology is what if one does have the ability to change, you know, identity or, you know, we talked about goals in AI, but what if, you know, you could change your own goals? You know, would we end up in a state, and we've all, I think, seen novels like Brave New World where you know, drugs that uh, wipe out ambition or that passivate um, uh, people's drives you know, can have uh, very negative consequences and, and so forth. So, um, so I think part of the problem is, um, I think talking about the brain sometimes has a stigma about it. You know, um, I was mm -hmm. on a panel once where mm -hmm. the chair of the panel asked the audience how many people had ever tried a brain enhancing drug uh, don't worry, I'm not going to do it here. Um, <laughs> and, and nobody raised their hand. Um, and then later, he, uh, he revealed that he had... Uh, he revealed that um, uh, he had done an anonymous poll earlier or something, and, and like 20% of the people should have raised their hand. So part of... Uh, I'm taking some inspiration from um, you know, other parts of biomedicine where I think it was 1975 when a lot of people uh, in molecular biology got together. Paul Berg chaired a conference at Asilomar, California. I think like a quarter of, 20% uh, of the attendees were press, and they decided to try to figure out, you know, could you have a conversation about what you want to do and what you don't want to do? And so, um, so one of the ideas is maybe it's time to have such a conversation about the brain um, before it becomes mm -hmm. a problem. You know, let's, let's start the conversation early enough that we can anticipate things, or at least try to anticipate things. And so, uh, yeah, so a few of us have started to talk about, would it be possible to have, you know, a global, neuroethics conference that brought together companies and scientists and, you know, all the stakeholders. So I, I don't think they've all been at, the, at, at a single mm -hmm. table before. Yeah. Anyone else? Having more children, David? <laughs> yeah, if Do you we need live, to have children? If Can you live forever, is there, if you live longer, is there a natural tendency to have less children? I, well, now there is because there's fertility limits. Do but. we need sex and race and gender then? 
and what are the differences that we're going to distinguish ourselves and when we can be healthy and live forever. Do I need, do I need sex? Is that the question? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's already decoupled from or reproduction. Drugs. <laughs> do I, do I need to augment my sex? Uh, <laughs> so uh, well, so one of the, <clears throat> the questions that I get a lot of is if we're successful, what happens to the planet if people really do live a long time? Now, if we stopped everyone dying tomorrow, and we're not going to be able to do that anytime soon, <clears throat> the, the rate of population growth would go up by about the same rate as immigration, which for some people is intolerable. Some of us, it is tolerable. But it's not, you can't go on forever. Okay? And um, I think Joe made the right point, which is that as countries become healthier, they become wealthier, and then they have less population. Actually, Bill Gates gave a really great uh, YouTube video uh, at his last annual report showing that the world is tapering off um, at around 10 billion people, yeah. even if we don't do anything um, different. I don't think people are going to have 10 kids just because they live longer. I, I don't think so. Uh, I can speak for myself. I'm, I'm quite happy with my procreation. Um, but it's also balanced by people who, uh, who don't uh, want to have children or cannot have children. And we see already in places like Japan and Europe that there's a decline in population already. Uh, and they need actually help to keep the elderly uh, healthier. I, I don't know if you, you know this statistic, but the average farm worker in Japan is 65 years old. Mm. This is a real problem for the world and the world's economy. And I think that population growth is the least of our concerns at, at this point. Max? Yeah. Just to <coughs> continue on this question of uh, what we should preserve about ourselves. I, I'm a firm believer of, I'm very enthusiastic about the commitment we have here at MIT to diversity and, and mm -hmm. to democracy and let people follow their own preferences. I don't think there's one right answer. I'd much rather that each of you ask what do you value and what do you want to preserve about yourself and how do you want it to be? But, but uh, I think there's a fascinating link between democracy and, and the ability of people to keep making their own choices and uh, inequality. Because uh, although I agree with you, George, that if you generally grow the pie enormously and the rich get way richer and everybody else also gets a bit richer, you're gonna get much less suffering and that's great. And I'm not into jealousy, <coughs> even though I was raised in Sweden with less income inequality. But I think there's a huge link between democracy and not having too much inequality because even though we normally talk about reducing inequality just to be nice to the poor, I think there's a complete separate argument, which is we can't have a functioning democracy mm. if inequality is too big. We've already seen that in many examples. When inequality gets too big, then it becomes far too easy for very mm. few to just mm -hmm. buy the institutions. And even though you might still have a democracy sort of in, th in name in certain countries, in practice you don't. When, and we love here to, of course, complain about other countries being undemocratic but there was this fascinating paper by this Professor Gillens in Princeton where he just <laughs> did a little linear regression. He looked at how Congress had voted on a vast number of issues over the years, and, he, and then he looked at opinion polls at the time and found that the correlation between whether a law got approved or not and whether people actually liked it or not was basically consistent with zero. Huh. But it was very, very consistent with what the lobbyists wanted, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, the more the, the, so I think there's a great value in, in reducing inequality, but not just to be nice to people, but to just make your democracy function. Mm. I was raised in Sweden, where there was more of a tradition that the whole v reason we have a country in the first place, the government, is that it should help everybody thrive. And I would love to s see a bit more of that here also now that we, uh, we um, try to make sure that AI doesn't just become the little toy for the super rich to decide everything, but everybody has a say. We know who's gonna make the, all these big decisions you asked about if we don't change things a little bit. It's gonna be a bunch of dudes maybe who've had too much Red Bull in the back room somewhere, uh, either in a tech company or maybe even, maybe even some shady military types. I don't feel that they should speak for all of humanity and make these important decisions. Just because you're good at programming AI doesn't even make you an expert on human happiness, mm -hmm. right? This should be the decisions everybody should really have a meaningful say in. 
Yeah, bravo. Um, is the robot economy going to be our salvation or a problem? Or uh, probably both, but what are your views? Is yeah, the robot economy? The robot economy, robot socialism. Oh, right. Where at some point <laughs> robots will make everything, right? Your old advisor, Rob Brooks, is very much a proponent of that. A lot of us buy into it. Um, what are people going to do? We just all, money doesn't matter. We have so much plenitude because the robots make it all. Or uh, there's going to be disparity. Or are we going to get bored? I want to answer that partly by pushing back on what Max just got a ton of uh, applause for, <laughs> and, and rightly so. Uh, imagine that you did get rid of the super rich. Uh, the, or the, the, you're still going to have lobbyists, because the lobbyists are going to reflect big corporations, which are c collections of middle class people, right? And they basically, it's another way of voting. Rather than voting through the ballots, we vote through our lobbyists. Uh, and, they, and so you could have everybody have exactly the same income and you would still have lobbyists. And if that's what's <laughs> correlating with the decision making in Congress, you still got a problem. Yep. Uh, so I'm not sure it's the super rich, a lot of super rich don't even want to influence things because they're happy, they, you know, they're really fine. Uh, it's the lobbyists, they mm -hmm. reflect our uh, voting. <clears throat> so then back to the robots that you're asking about, <laughs> the robots are uh, a, in a certain sense, we're hi they're, they're hybrids, they're, they, for the foreseeable future, they're working with us, mm -hmm. and they represent a new entity like uh, corporations. Corporations are an entity. They have legal status as citizens. Uh, robots will probably, or hybrids, will have similar rights. And they're just going to be us. It's, it's like we've met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> so right? we, we won't get taxes from robots to support humans, necessarily, because the robots could resent it <laughs> in principle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the problem with robots is if 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 one of, if if they if they get the right to vote, yeah. uh, then whoever makes the most robots gets the most votes. Uh, uh, <laughs> but that's again giving the keys to the AI, which is very much in, in Max's uh, ballpark with uh, your yeah. thinking. So first of all, of course I agree with you. The, the institutions that we want to have strong shouldn't just resist purchase by very rich individuals. They have to resist being purchased by by corporations too. Otherwise, it, it doesn't work. I think but they can't. The, 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 the corporations represent our, our wishes, really, at some yeah. level. I mean, they try to influence our, it's a, yeah. it's a weird yeah. feedback loop sure. where they, they advertise and they get us to want things we don't want. But roughly <laughs> speaking, we are asking ourselves to want things we don't, but we there don't are really want. But there are policy know? changes that could make institutions a lot less resilient towards lobbying by corporations, I think you probably before. But more, more fundamentally, the, the question of this thing about would we, what if we don't have jobs anymore or whatever? Mm. I think people are too gloomy there. <clears throat> Most of you guys don't work in factories or farms right now. You seem pretty happy anyway, mm. right? How, who's a student? Yeah, suppose you could, who's a grad student? So suppose you keep getting your grad student stipend, but uh, you don't even have to like TA or, or do anything you're forced to. You'd probably still be quite, keep doing cool stuff, right? Uh, mm. Jobs today give us three things. They give us income, they give us a sense of purpose, and they give us often f friends mm -hmm. as well, right? If we have ro robots and, and, and machines uh, or the stores do all the work and distribute the income properly to us, we don't need to do the work part. We just have to pay attention to making sure we make a society where we still feel meaning and, and purpose. I think most of you would be pretty happy if you just have a lifelong vacation and do whatever you want. That's what no, we I call tenure at MIT. <laughs> 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 Not exactly. But, but it doesn't happen automatically. <laughs> some people just, were, even in the Middle Ages, some people who were born very rich just burn themselves out in opium or whatever. Yeah. You have to create a society where people find meaning and purpose in other ways. And I'm curious how you propose to do that. You're probably the biggest expert on this, <laughs> with, you know, without yeah. the work. Hmm. Yeah, we have a, an unusual population here, definitely, because whether I think whether I was paid or not, I would still be here every day, sort of. <laughs> I'm on sabbatical. I'm still here. Yeah, I th thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a trick. Like, can we can we make it possible for everybody to find uh, something they're passionate about, basically? And, yeah. I mean, uh, Sweden, where you have 
money to some extent decoupled from what people do, because mm -hmm. it's a social economy. It still is coupled, but it's a looser coupling than here, because there's a safety net. I think some of the best music in the world is coming from there, because it isn't related to having mm -hmm. to make a profit. Yeah. People are doing what they're passionate about, not caring about making money. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little job, but the government supports them enough to do it, mm -hmm. and it, it's working mm -hmm. there. Hmm. Well, still, I don't know if this is on. Can you hear me up the back? That's better. Yeah. There will still be jobs in the future. We, we humans, we love other humans. Um, I guess we can love robots too, but we still want the human touch. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were kids, we were told, by the time we, we grow up, there will be no jobs left. Yeah, right. We've got the lowest unemployment in decades, um, possibly yeah. ever, in this country. There's always things to do that are more interesting than fixing car wrecks and mm -hmm. things that actually one day won't be done by humans. And so I, actually, I went down, uh, what is King's Road in Cape Cod, and there's this old bookstore. And I went in there and I was flicking through old magazines. Um, there was a Life magazine from the mid-1960s that said, millions of people are gonna be out of work in the US, these intelligent machines are coming, what are we gonna do? Oh, well, people will have to work only two or three days a week. We've heard this before and I think if you look at history, we don't have to worry about it going forward either. Mm -hmm. I read a novel from, a short story by Ted Chang, the guy that wrote Arrival, it's an amazing story. Very short, about, it's about the future of academics, basically. It kind of relates to what we've been talking about. And uh, there's an option to enhance people at birth where they become super intelligent. You know, not unlike some of the stuff that's been discussed, but it has to be done at birth. It's, you can't do it afterward. So parents make this difficult choice. Their children diverge from them. And then they start doing science experiments together. And they have their own language. And, and we, but people in academia still try to publish in journals. So the question is, what are our articles? What does that work mean anymore? And there's this whole other class mm -hmm. of people doing this work we can't even conceive mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. you know, will there be this gap? That's one of the big questions, I think. It could be relative to wealth. Mm -hmm. Change took it a different way. This is now a commodity. It's like IVF. Anybody with some modest means can do it. Uh, but you make that choice, you're going to lose your kids as we know them now. It's a different kind of a thing. And probably kind of like coming back to your initial presentation that you gave with all this amazing sci-fi, um, what would be like the avenue of bringing more of those voices of arts and just kind of like imagination and uh, some of the things that have been there for like 70 years now and only now they're becoming like the reality and then also how to make even in our small like engineering and science, society, some of the voices that are not heard because it's not because we don't want them to be heard, but because they are not there because mm -hmm. it's very hard to get out there. So um, it's also like a burden on us to, as an organization to do that. And like, how would you like basically Zapians to um, grow and like not mm -hmm. only include that, but also include everything else to be able to, as Ed mentioned, certain engineer the serendipity widely to map out all the possible biology that we can have and evolution didn't get to, as George mentioned, and um, united with all the, all, 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 all the things that we can think about from the information standpoint, as you mentioned, Max. I think that's a great closing uh, question for I, everybody, actually. I think people from arts and other non-nerdy fields have an incredibly valuable thing to contribute by helping us formulate a positive vision for the future that we can all rally around. Mm -hmm. I often get students coming into my office in Building 37 for career advice, and I always ask them, what future are you excited about? Where do you want to be in the future? And if all she can say is, oh, maybe I'll have cancer. <laughs> maybe I'll get murdered. You know, terrible strategy for career planning. I want her to come in <laughs> with fire in her eyes and say, this is where I want to be. And then you can talk about the pitfalls and strategies for getting there. But think about how we as a species, as homo sapiens, go about doing our collective career planning. We go to the movies and watch Blade Runner and Terminator and one dystopia after another. <laughs> Even if you go look at the religious text, there's much more detail about hell and heaven than most religions. <laughs> uh, right? Maybe it gets more clicks. But it, it, it's, it's exactly like what I was making fun of here. And I think, to answer your question, you know, Everybody, not just tech nerds like so many of us, but people from all walks of life really need to, at parties and when we go for coffee, whatever, really work on envisioning the destination that we're on fire about. Because the more we know what we want, the more collaboration we're going to foster towards building that future. And the more likely we are to get it. I 
like everyone to kind of go over that question. Also, Joy, <laughs> I, I can ask questions to you now, so <laughs> you can also answer that. Well, uh, I, I th I, I'm at the point now where I don't really remember what the question was because it had many <laughs> parts to it that were all interesting. <laughs> Let the panel talk, and uh, then I'm happy to, to hang around. So, Patty. I, I forgot what the question was as well. This is why I need augmented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's about including not heard voices, arts, yeah, no, women I in science. I completely agree. I'm very excited about, for example, the College of Computing. Yeah. Um, that just was sort of uh, announced, uh, I mean, or uh, started this week or last week, um, because it will finally create more bridges, sort of. And I'm especially uh, interested in the bridges from the humanities and history, social sciences, political sciences, and so on. Um, those people um, infecting sort of what the computer scientists and the AI people at MIT end up working on. We desperately need sort of that influence um, in that direction, much more so than the computer scientists teaching the humanities people how to use deep learning or whatever. Yeah. yeah. George, do you want to? Uh... Uh, just briefly, uh, you know, I, the. I, th I think the lesson of evolution and to some extent engineering is diversity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. More ideas and more viewpoints you have, you never know who's going to have the, the breakthrough idea uh, even if, and who's going to implement it. Uh, and there's an interesting question is, do we have enough diversity and is there too much? You know, so if we get to the point where we can engineer anything, in, including diversity, mm -hmm. where, do we, where do we stop that? Uh, that's a, but I, I think that mm -hmm. some people think that as we get great power, we'll become a monoculture where mm -hmm. it'll just be kilometer after kilometer of identical corn plants. Uh, I, I, don't, I think if you look around our, our cultural centers, the number of, of artifacts and ideas is more diverse than it's ever mm -hmm. been. Yeah. So I'm mm -hmm. hoping for diversity. I mm -hmm. just don't know where the limit is. Maybe mm -hmm. there isn't one. Uh, bravo, that uh, diversity uh, is, is just so important to progress. And, you know, it's needed. Yeah, well, you mentioned serendipity in, in your framing of the question. And I think if you look at a lot of the problems in modern life, like in medicine, but also if you look at economics, education, and so forth, there's so many moving parts and so many building blocks and how they interact that the problems are really, really complex. And that means that, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned how Albert Einstein had one good a really, really great year. He had some other great years too, but, but one really, really great year. Um, but if you look at you know a lot of other problems like in biomedicine, you know a lot of it is about you know having that different point of view or that flash of insight or that burst of luck. And and so I think the, mm -hmm. it'd be very interesting to maybe even deliberately try to study, you know, how diversity influences biomedical innovation and whether mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. there is a way to 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 foster those chance connections. Uh, but a lot of the great biomedical discoveries, you know, have come from very you know, uh, interesting and remote parts of the mm -hmm. human condition. So. David? Uh, yeah, that, that was all well said. I, I think the, the only thing I want to add is that uh, you guys, you all are living in the best age ever. Uh, it's only going to keep getting better. When I started my lab, this is going back 20 years ago at Harvard, it was, it was crazy to think that you would... Uh, work with industry so closely, but we live in a, a world now where you can work across the globe with people on the other side of the planet quite easily. You can bring together teams from industry, people who know how to make drugs, know how to make robots, know how to think about philosophy, and it's, it's those teams that will thrive in this century, uh, and anyone else who just focuses on, on one problem with one viewpoint will be left behind. Uh, and I want to close um, my comments by, by thanking the Exapiens group, because first of all, you brought together a, a great crowd tonight. But in particular, I wanted to commend you on bringing a diverse group of people like us, uh, the speakers tonight. Not diverse um, enough. It's, okay. it's rare that I feel so privileged to be part of something <laughs> like this. Thank you. Uh, I echo that. Thank you very much to the Sapienza here.